Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science, Module 6 on Hazards. This is the final video, we're looking at meteorology and natural weather events. So in this final video, we're going to be uh, continuing our little series on looking at some of the technologies associated with uh, predicting and minimising the impact of potential hazards or disasters. So we're going to focus this time on meteorology and the prediction and prevention of damage to life and infrastructure as a result of natural weather events. So again, I'm going to give you a chat about extreme weather during a period of fairly extreme weather. And that is has happened again. Sydney uh, has been smashed with some very serious weather and some flooding that's happened once again. Um, up here in beautiful Port Stephens, uh, it's, there's been a fair bit of rain, but certainly not to the extent that uh, has been in other parts of the state. The thing is, we want quality forecasting if we're going to have um, enough information to help us to at least minimise or avoid some of the impacts of these sorts of disastrous events. So we want to know where storms are now, how they form, where they're going to be moving towards, so which direction they're going to be heading, um, what sort of damage they could potentially cause, how long they're going to last, and so many other factors that are really about trying to track the progress of each of these types of weather patterns from one day through to the next. There's a lot of technology that's associated with uh, weather prediction. Still is, I guess, one of those imprecise sciences where we still can't quite get it right all the time, but certainly we're gathering lots and lots of data from weather stations at ground level, in the ocean, in the upper uh, atmosphere, uh, and also up in the satellite regions in order to help us to put lots of bits and pieces of information together, usually are being processed by very powerful computers that allow us to uh, make the predictions that we do. Doppler radar is another area that we're going to have a quick look at as well um, in terms of data collection and also movement of that data towards the production of a particular uh, forecast. Now, the problem with the atmosphere is very chaotic. There's so many different um, factors that could affect what's going on in our weather patterns, in the patterns of air movement, uh, the masses of air moving from one place to another, the Coriolis effect, which is spinning the earth as well, um, things like the convection cells, which are creating patches of warm and cool and little cycles of these um, air masses. So there's a lot of factors and the chaotic nature of the atmosphere makes this a very, very uh, difficult thing to, for us to do in the long term. But we do rely on more and more technologies that allow us to, I guess, get a little bit better at the process. So this is a Doppler radar. Our radar is going to be using some of the electromagnetic spectrum to gather data on a range of different sorts of things. Um, we tend to get from radars locations and strength of things like rainfall, um, snowfalls. The Doppler radar gives us a little bit of extra information on top of that, including things like wind speeds, wind directions, and the boundaries between warm and cold fronts. And this is very important when we're trying particularly to um, predict changes in weather patterns and where they might be coming from and potentially how long they're going to take to arrive. The introduction of Doppler radars are a fantastic and indispensable tool for weather forecasters. Now your school may have um, weather observation tools, ours certainly does, and, um, and we collect information which is actually made available in real time on um, our internal website. We don't have satellites, uh, we don't have drop zones, or, but we do have weather stations. And so these are ga gathering information about rainfall, about wind direction and wind speed, um, air temperature and those sorts of things. Lots more data is obviously needed if we're going to be trying to make um, predictions on a larger scale. And so some of these other things uh, may be located uh, in the oceans. Sometimes they're located on moving objects like ships or aeroplanes. And so then they're recording um, data in real time over a particular range of locations. Um, and each of these is providing more data that's coming back to usually a centralized computer, a centralized system that's um, drawing in all of that data and making sense of it. Drop zones are uh, basically a device that's like um, to, to oversimplify it, it would be like going up in a balloon and dropping a, a thermometer that's basically a, a data logging thermometer out of the balloon and it falls to the earth and as it falls it, it records the temperature all the way down. 
think about it in that kind of a way. It's obviously a little bit more sophisticated than that and certainly a little more expensive than that. Um, but these are really good ways of kind of getting um, a, an amount of data about a particular area and what's happening to the, to the air at different um, altitudes. Satellites are a critical part of our weather story. And so there's a lot of different information that uh, is going to be channeled together into a supercomputer to make predictions about the weather. To try and process all this information would just be a nightmare. So one of the ways um, that we've been able to deal with huge amounts of data is through computing power. So um, all the mathematical calculations, all the organizing of all the data that's coming from all these different sources is what we use supercomputers for. Processing over 2 billion operations a, sec a second. This is a massive operation and lots and lots of information coming from lots of different sources. And if it's coming from things like um, planes and ships, then it's got to be correlated against their positions as well. So all of these different calculations are trying to give us information about air pressure and temperature, the amount of radiation that's coming from the sun, the Earth's rotation and how that's affecting winds via the Coriolis effect, um, things like the water cycle, as well as all the information that we need to know or that you would expect to get in a normal weather report around the maximum minimum temperatures, the amount of rainfall that's fallen since nine o'clock yesterday morning, and so on. All of this data, huge amount of data that's coming in on a regular basis to help us to understand something about the weather to predict particularly um, serious weather events. Um, and obviously one of the most serious weather events that we worry about in Australia are things like cyclones. Um, but cyclones tend to be um, restricted to a lot of the northern parts of Australia. And what we've seen or what we're experiencing um, just recently is um, large rainfall events. And these rainfall events are occasioning huge amounts of rain in short periods of time that are creating great problems um, around flooding. So this is what this final section of our study of hazards has been about. Ways that we can use technology to do some prediction about when events might occur, uh, to try and do some minimization to get a sense of how we might deal with a certain type of disaster, whether we've got time to evacuate people or take certain precautions, or whether we're going to have to try and have um, measures put in place beforehand that still will allow us to minimize potential damage that could happen as a result of these kinds of events, um, but, which, but for which we may not have sufficient time to actually be doing things like evacuating people. So one thing that I encourage you to do is to visit the Government uh, Bureau of Meteorology. Lots of really good maps, synoptic maps for you to just familiarize yourself with so you're used to seeing them. Um, but also to look at rain radars and the radars usually will give you um, a sequence of shots that show you how those um, cloud masses are moving, which direction they're coming from and where they're going to, and also how fast they're moving. If you get a little bit of an idea about how these things work, then we get a really good picture of how our um, weather prediction uh, processes are going, how good the technology is to, to be able to help us to predict the weather, and hopefully how much we can do in order to try to minimise the damage from uh, weather-related events. As always, thanks for watching.